Yeah, Rich. Right. From Ohio, and, and uh, she uh, did a master's degree at the University of Calgary. She was kind of stuck with that. And she ended up uh, doing a PhD at the University of Montana. Um, she has had a really long and varied career to academics, government, private sector. Uh, she taught in Calgary at the Royal, Mount Royal College for a while. She taught in, uh, at Montana Tech for a couple of years. Couple of years. Yeah, yeah, my husband outlasted me for about 30 years he was here. Uh -huh. But yeah, so you can for a while. Her husband, Chuck White. And um, worked for the USGS, Forest Service, and all of these things. But in 1991, she started her own consulting company, which is the Whitehall Geo Group, Inc. And uh, her consulting work includes the minerals assessment, hydrogeology, oil and gas, paleontological, resource evaluation, geologic mapping, and creating websites for geopostings and earthmap.com. So, uh, and she's, she's focused primarily on stratigraphy, specifically continental sequence stratigraphy and paleosol. And um, hands up for anybody who's seen confusing paleosols around. Uh, yeah, that's just about all of us. So, uh, this is going to be good. Take it away. All right. Uh, thanks to everybody for coming out here. Um, I'll talk about tertiary geology in southwestern Montana. And what I'm going to do is split the talk into two main segments. I'm going to talk first about just the background for tertiary geology, how people got started working with basin fill, a little history about the people involved in it, a um, little bit about uh, stratigraphic approaches because I think anybody that's worked with tertiary basin fill in this area, you probably just start out and think it's just a chaotic pile of rocks. And it's true, it is chaotic, but it's possible to sort out the pile of rocks and a lot of really interesting data can be derived from that. So I'll go on from there and then talk about a few projects that I'm currently involved with. So this just started out and uh, last summer we had a group of people that uh, did a tour looking at the tertiary geology in southwestern Montana, specifically on a project, I'll jump a little bit ahead, collecting uh, volcanic ash units and vertebrate paleo. And one of the places we went to is the Sage Creek area. So here you see us kind of uh, climbing over a typical tertiary outcrop. And you'll see most people are kind of sitting down and looking at the ground very closely because we're really looking for fossil mammals. And typically some of these things, which I'll show in various slides later on in the project part, they're really small. Um, but as you'll see in the stratigraphy part, it's pretty critical to find those because we need age constraints to figure out that uh, the chaotic pile of rocks. Okay, a little background on southwestern Montana tertiary deposits. Most of the deposits are found in the valleys of southwestern Montana, Gallatin, Madison, Beaverhead, etc. There's a lot of tertiary buried in those valleys. Uh, in the Big Hole Valley, some of the wells that have been drilled, deposits are up to 16,000 feet in thickness. Um, you look around on the basin margins, we only see usually a couple hundred feet of deposits. But the wells that have gone in, in both the Big Hole and the Deer Lodge Valley, um, are quite thick, even in the Jefferson Valley. So we're looking at eight to 16,000 feet of tertiary deposits. So a lot of it is hidden from view and only by subsurface data can we add that to the geologic picture? And quite honestly, we don't have a lot of subsurface data. So that, that does really complicate the picture for trying to sort out tertiary deposits. Um, 
Boy, work on tertiary deposits really did begin with the Hayden survey that came through this area about 1871-72. And they actually came up through Sage Creek. Uh, Alan Tabern from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History is trying to <coughs> replot their traverse. But the significant thing, at least for this talk, is that in the Sage Creek area and possibly at that exposure outcropping that I just showed in the lead slide, they found an equid jaw, a horse jaw, and got the idea that probably we're looking at tertiary deposits. Uh, a little later on, about a decade later, two workers in the White Sulphur Springs area amassed a pretty good collection of vertebrate fossils. It was Koch and Scott that did this. But, and I'll talk about this uh, as one of our projects, it was really Earl Douglas who came out to teach in the lower Madison Valley in 1894. The schoolhouse is still there, in fact. I'll show a photo of that. But Earl Douglas got things going with his investigations into the vertebrate paleontology of these tertiary units. Um, much, much later, we had uh, different universities focusing on tertiary deposits. And in my estimation, the greatest contribution was made by Bob Fields, a vertebrate paleontologist professor at the University of Montana in Missoula. Bob got there in the late 1950s and left uh, kind of mid-1980s. I was his last student, in fact. And it wasn't because of me that he left. But, but Bob and his students just amassed this incredible database of vertebrate paleontology. And really, to get age constraints on many parts of the tertiary sections in southwestern Montana, most people use that database. So Bob and his students, I think, really added to our knowledge of tertiary geology and paleontology. And of course, there have been other workers, uh, MSU University students, that have been out in the field as well, kind of coming up to the present day. Um, one distinction I think everyone should be aware of is there is a difference, I think, in looking at tertiary deposits, thinking about geomorphic present-day valleys like the Jefferson Valley, Gallatin Valley, versus depositional basins, tertiary depositional basins. Um, it, it's really pretty typical of extensional terrains, those terrains that are pulled apart, uh, to have multiple depositional basins within a geographic valley. And it's, it's good for a first approximation to use, uh, if I can find, oh yeah, there it is, a Bouguet gravity map just to get an idea of where those depositional basins are. And it turns out we do have some subsurface data, and this looks to be the Waterloo subbasin, for instance, about 10,000 feet um, total tertiary thickness. Coming down here to, by Twin Bridges, about 8,000 feet. Uh, and the other thing that I think is essential when you think about these depositional basins is that most of the sections we measure, and in this area, I'm just showing you some of the section locations that I've measured, as well as other people that have worked in the Jefferson Valley, for instance. They're all basin margin sections. And so, consequently, they are quite thin compared to the total bulk of tertiary deposits in those depositional basins. That means for the geologic record, you know, we're seeing a condensed section, basically, an amalgamation of tertiary deposits that span from, let's say, 55 million years ago uh, to about 2 million years ago. So we're missing a good part of the record by not having that detailed subsurface data. OK, um, boy, tertiary stratigraphy. The lithostratigraphy that um, came from basically two sources, Bob Fields, in, uh, his first PhD student in the early 70s, 
and uh, USGS worker Robinson, uh, who was working up by Tostin, in the late 60s, um, we came up with basically, or they came up with, a lithostratigraphy, which just means uh, rock types. You know, lithology, you're just talking about sandstone versus shale versus uh, conglomerate, for instance. So by using lithology, and this is the formal stratigraphy that most people use today, there is a unit called RENOVA, which is uh, lithologically, according to the uh, definition, the formal definition, predominantly fine-grained, you know, uh, fine sand and finer. That is separated from the Six Mile Creek formation by what's called a mid-tertiary unconformity, which actually, time-wise, isn't really mid-tertiary, but anyways, a major unconformity here, and then the Six Mile Creek is thought of as predominantly coarse-grained. Uh, conglomerates, for instance, you know, uh, fragments about this large in diameter, uh, could be boulders, but coarse grain for Six Mile Creek, basically, versus fine grain. Um, well, you know, I, I had a real problem mapping with that because it turns out, I mean, we contemplate walking across the present day basin. You know, going from the basin margin out into the active trunk stream. And basically, lithologically, going from alluvial fans out to floodplain to the channels. I mean, that whole landscape package includes a variety of lithologies. And now think about where you might sample that if there was a geologic record left behind. And going back to that one slide I showed of the multiple depositional basins, more than likely in this area, that will be sampled at the basin margins. And so already, you know, you've really uh, biased your sampling, but also because of very rapid and sometimes apparently random facies changes, um, it becomes very hard to make consistent lithologic correlations. Uh, certainly within a valley, you know, going from depositional basin to depositional basin, and then certainly from valley to valley, going from the Jefferson to the Gallatin, for instance. All right, so if there are these problems with lithostratigraphy, how, how does one resolve that? What kind of stratigraphic approach might work in the tertiary of southwestern Montana? So, of course, here's my approach. I have an idea, and um, you know, it seems to work relatively well, both on the surface and in the subsurface, which I'll show you some subsurface data from the Deer Lodge Basin. But I've gone to a sequence stratigraphic approach. And basically, those sequences are bounded by unconformities. Those are times of near non-deposition, you know, a stability of the land surface. So the accommodation space is not great. I mean, you're not sinking a hole into the valleys where a lot of sediment piles up. So, using that idea, um, uh, yeah, there's a the laser. You can actually delineate five separate sequences to span the tertiary geologic record as we know it. So, sequence one, for instance, which um, would include in our area a lot of volcanic rocks, lowland creek volcanics, for instance, and their associated uh, sedimentary deposits. And that would span a time period from, you know, roughly about, oh shoot, 52 to about 40, 44 million years. Sequence two, again, notice uh, bounded by major unconformities. Sequence two is that rock package which includes units deposited age-wise anywhere from about 38, 37 million years to about 
31 million years. Another major unconformity, sequence three, of course, would be a little younger, 26 to about 20. Sequence four, 16 million years to about two, and then sequence five, the most recent, two million years to the present. So those are really large rock packages, but I think what's significant is just taking those large rock packages, uh, you'll notice that I have them uh, correlated. Eric Cheney in Washington did work over there, so I have sequence one, for instance, correlated with the chalice, and he could identify, he called it uh, lower katatas, upper katatas, Walpapi, and then the high cascade. You know, age-wise, they correlate rather well. You can also do that correlation and take those large packages out to the Great Plains. And in that case, some of you who have worked with uh, sediments, paleo, would know this as the White River, this as the Rickery, and this as the Ogallala. Um, my sequences are constrained by age dates, and that's where it goes back to that database that Bob Fields and his students built up. Uh, vertebrate fossils, you'll notice on this side, North American land mammal ages. The vertebrate people talk in terms of fossil assemblages, like my sequence two would include Chedronium to Aurelin. There's really not much Whitmian around here, just a few places down by Dillon that we know of. Um, and I can't stress enough that this is now only what we know of. You know, there may be, for instance, we were talking earlier today with a couple people about Paleocene deposits. Might be, we just don't have any age data to tell us that those are here, that anyone has really found so far. Uh, but what I find about the sequences, and you'll notice that I have over here calcic paleosol stacks. The sequences, because they're really denoting a time of land stability, not much accommodation space, soils build up. Over time, those soils are quite thick. And climatically, because once, we get out of the Paleocene, which there was a very warm, wet time. It's called the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum about 55 million years ago when it was hot and moist. Upward through the section, it becomes much cooler and drier. And so soil-wise, what we find are soils that are high in calcium carbonate. And in fact, some of those soils, given enough time, and now I'm talking about tens of thousands of years, they build up caliches. And you probably tried to dig a garden or whatever around southwestern Montana and hit that white kind of hard layer. That is the beginning of what I find of uh, calcic paleosols that mark these sequence boundaries. Um, and I put this in just so I wouldn't forget to say something about the correlative conformity. Because one of the problems when you talk about basin margin sections is how to get that sequence boundary across the basin. Because at some point, there will be deposition. And that deposition may be in the trunk stream area, most likely will be in the trunk stream area. But when sequence stratigraphy and seismic stratigraphy was in its, uh, well, I shouldn't say infancy, but uh, kind of coming on to the popular stage, in 1977, Mitchum came out with the idea of the correlative conformity. And all that means is that as you follow um, a basin margin unconformity into a basin center, you'll probably get into a conformable part of that unit, meaning there's deposition taking place. Um, if you don't push that uh, composite surface through the basin center, what you'll end up with is a bunch of unconformities on this side of the basin and a lot of 
nonconformities on the other side of the basin. So with the marine sequence stratigraphers, yeah, that was the way to push a sequence across. And I think that's exactly what we do in continental sequence stratigraphy as well. So there is an unconformity marked by paleosol development at basin margins that I'll show you can be very well developed. But going into the basin center, it probably is a conformity. Deposition is taking place. OK, so what do the calcite paleosols look like? Um, well, when I first started running across these, they've been mapped, boy, for a lot of depositional environments. I mean, lacustrine, so lake deposits, uh, hot springs deposits. But when one really starts to look at the features of these limestone units, because, boy, they are lithified. They are actual limestones. What one finds is, whoops, ah, sorry. Let's go back. What one finds is a really nice soil <coughs> profile. And actually, uh, coming down from the surface, you know, there's typically the O horizon organic, the A horizon starting to get into a mineral horizon, B horizon, which in many soils is clay rich, and then into ah, more like the parent material. In calcium paleosols, if it's well lithified, well indurated, I mean, it's just hard, it's called a K horizon. And in all honesty, in most areas that I found calcic paleosols, it's the K horizon that's left. Because, I mean, that's the well indurated, the one that is not prone to erosion. But just to look at a few of the K horizon features, there are typically laminations, and all these are just a buildup of calcic material. The uh, calcium carbonate is assumed to be coming down from the surface, so it's just plugging up the soil over time, time and time again. Um, there are, I mean, it pushes aside pre-existing class, so you'll see floating pieces of rock in those K horizons. Um, root structures are usually ubiquitous in those things. As one goes down towards the bottom, uh, K into the parent material, you'll start to see things like stringers, could be silicic, could be calcium carbonate. Uh, you can see also a chalky nodular zone. But these things, these calcic paleosols, really show up well in the rock record, so much so that in Various areas, Madison Bluffs, for instance, uh, just east of Three Forks, those paleosols form big ledges. And they tend to be stacks of paleosols. They may be up to 15 meters thick. Paleosol, a little bit of deposition, another paleosol developed on that deposition. Uh, you find those like uh, in Madison Bluffs, in the upper ruby. There are different uh, delineators for different sequences. Here, you're probably looking at Eocene below, Miocene above. Here, Oligocene, maybe early Miocene below, mid to late Miocene above up here. And in the central Deer Lodge Valley, and I'll talk about this a little more in detail, in a couple slides on, maybe the next slide, I've forgotten now, but, but this paleosol stack uh, sits just north of Deer Lodge, uh, just north of the old Stagecoach Road. And this particular one became very uh, crucial to our work in the subsurface with well log seismic data. But again, you can see that each of these stacks is made up of individual paleosols, just stack one upon the other. So denoting a lot of time for that land surface to basically be dormant, not accumulating a lot of sediment. Okay, so yeah, into the subsurface. Uh, in the Deer Lodge Valley back in the 80s, several wells were drilled in the valley. 
Most were dry. There was one well drilled that actually had a pretty good show of gas, but you know, uh, basically no infrastructure close to that. So they were all capped off, but at least there's some seismic data, subsurface data, and some well log data that we can use to look at a surface section, that one you saw in the last slide, and try and correlate that with subsurface data to see if a sequence approach works both on the surface as well as in the subsurface. And in regard to that, first what we did is generate a synthetic seismogram. And this was work done by Jim Halverson, now at the Montana Board of Oil and Gas, and my husband, Chuck Whiteman. Uh, Chuck's the geophysicist, and Jim is really the uh, oil and gas person. But anyways, what we did is first did a synthetic seismogram, just trying to tie seismic data to well log data to see, notice these dark lines on the sections. Those are zones of bright reflectors, which would tell one that those are zones of high velocity, high density. Uh, so immediately when we started doing that, we thought, well, are those our calcic paleosol stacks? And so then we went to uh, well log data and looked at resistivity as well as a uh, compensated neutron log set of data and tried to match that with the stratigraphic section that we had measured. And on those logs, what we could differentiate for this zone of bright reflectors is that uh, argillic zones, probably low resistivity areas, uh, the limestone, so therefore the calcic paleosol zones, low porosities. And they seem to match up quite well. And over here is the actual strat section that we measured and now compared to a mineral ID matrix that we looked at clay, calcium carbonate, and quartz content. And once again, you know, the zones seem to match up fairly well with limestone versus quartz clay content. So I think one can make a fairly good case for tying subsurface paleosol stacks with uh, subsurface data and interpreting that as the calcic paleosol stacks. Okay, well, back to the Cenozoic sequences that I've defined. Um, time duration for those packages of rocks, the sequences are, you know, in the range of a third order sequence. Third order sequences are anywhere for durations 1 million to 10 million years. Those, that package of sequences, probably match up best with uh, regional kinematic activities, so uh, tectonic events for the regions. And I think one thing that, I mean, this is a very broad brush approach, but one interpretation I had is that uh, from sequence one up until sequence three, <coughs> timing-wise, that can match up with metamorphic core complex. It actually turns out that the bulk of sedimentation, when you look at subsurface data, is actually within sequence two. So that was the time of greatest accommodation. So basin depositional formation. Um, here is that what um, the former lithostratigraphers would call the mid-tertiary unconformity, and I've just called it the Hemingfordian unconformity, Hemingfordian just being that land mammal age that seems to correlate to that time interval. And then what we might call the basin and range extension phase. So I really think that the sequences that I've defined are controlled by tectonism. You know, there's always some discussion about tectonism versus climate, but actually, probably climate, you're really looking at uh, units that are less in age, 
you know, in terms of thousands of years to hundreds of thousands of years that would correlate with Milankovitch cycles. So these are really on a broader scale of time duration. So, okay, so that's my broad brush approach to that. Uh, now, what I want to do is just take you through some of the projects that I've been working on with other people. Um, right now, I've got three main ongoing projects. The biggest one is the collection of fossil vertebrates and associated tufts and ashes from various localities in southwestern Montana. Um, trying to relocate and integrate Earl Douglas's vertebrate fossil sites in the Madison Bluff area. And then the summer we'll start a project in the Gravelly Range looking at the tertiary geology and vertebrate paleontology of that area. Um, okay, this is the first project. This just shows us that uh, last summer the crew that went around southwestern Montana it included Alan Tabron from the Carnegie Museum, Dave Wade, an MSU student, Don Lochran uh, from the Raymond Alf and the Webb Schools in Claremont, California. It turns out Don now owns the Pipestone locality just west of Whitehall. Crystal Nielsen from MSU, Matthew Haynes from MSU, and Paul Germano from MSU. And this shows Ellen giving us a little bit of a lecture at Sage Creek down by the Lima Dell area that happens to be his favorite focus down there. But what we wanted to do is go to places that we have both known vertebrate assemblages, <coughs> ages associated with those, and to collect some volcanic material as closely associated to those fossil zones as possible. And our intent was, of course, as I talked before, intervalley stratigraphic correlation. I mean, it turns out that fossil sites are great, but when you go out and look at those, they're this spot over here, that spot over here, over here, and in the tertiary deposits in southwestern Montana, the valleys aren't that well excavated yet. So you're really jumping from, I mean, it's like a kind of connect the dot exercise. Um, but if one can find a tuft that's a layer of volcanic ash, and it's not been really reworked, uh, they're more like blankets, and they're great datum. So they're horizons that one can trace across the landscape. And, and usually those volcanic events can be found in many different valleys in southwestern Montana. So our hope is to get enough of those that we can really have a consistent um, stratigraphic correlation in the area. Um, and sequence boundary delineation, you know, I showed you those calcic paleosol stacks and I do have age constraints, but it would be nice to actually tighten those up a lot in many places. So we're going for that. Uh, the North American land mammal ages calibration. Uh, it turns out in all this time, we have these vertebrate sites, but really no one has ever taken even the well-known vertebrate sites, collected a volcanic unit from that site, I mean, you know, close to where the fossils are, and gotten an age date. So we know, I mean, do these really correlate to something in the Great Plains or in California? Was there a time lapse for migration in between there? I mean, we say Shadronian, and everyone that works with these thinks, oh yeah, well, about 36 million years to 34 million years ago. But is that really true for southwestern Montana? We have no way of correlating those yet. So that's one hope. And then um, the Eocene Oligocene boundary and its association, uh, its associated paleoclimatic change. Uh, at that boundary, that was, you know, I talked about that Eocene, Eocene thermal event about 55 million years ago, but the next big event was about 34 million years ago. 
I think right now it's pegged at 33.7, you know, a little error bar in there, million years ago. But that was the start of drying out and cooling off. And really, that set the stage for us for the rest of the section. We have some ideas, of course, based on vertebrates, where that should be. Like, there should be a boundary out at the Palisades, which is uh, west of Whitehall, the base of Home Stake Pass. Those exposures you've probably seen north of the interstate. Over by Three Forks, there are sections. Sage Creek, of course, should have that same boundary there. That boundary is well known uh, in the marine world for a section in Italy. Uh, the Massignano section. Uh, that is the peg right now, but for continental sections, I mean, it's not as well defined. So that was our intent. And people working on this, uh, like I said, uh, Alan Tabron from the Carnegie, Dale Hansen, who is not in this photo from the Museum of the Rockies. Jack Horner actually was good enough to give us the money for the age analyses and there are currently 11 of them are being run at the Mexico Geochronology Lab, New Mexico Geochronology Lab. Um, and then our vertebrate paleo guy, another one is Don Lofgren from the Raymond Alf Web Schools. So that's basically the group. Uh, Crystal actually is working with us more so on the graph of Grappley Range project, but some MSU students are still involved in addition to Bristol on this. Okay, now I'm just going to show you a few locales, kind of the fossils and, and the general geology from what we collected this year. And here's a map just showing you those different sites going from Canyon Ferry, Four Corners basically, Antony North, and then to Pipe Summit. So I'll pick out a few of these localities and show you what I think are pretty neat features. Um, the Antony site over by Four Corners, first discovered in 1939, Carnegie Museum. Um, you know, basically nice tufts in there, so ash deposits, volcanic ash deposits that are lithified. Um, also, a lot of fossils, fragmentary for the most part, uh, but road construction has especially uh, Anthony North. We think the original site, which Alan Tabern thought was possibly here according to photos, so a little ways to the west of what we're calling Anthony North and where our samples have come from. But it looks like distributed fluvial systems. I mean, you're talking about alluvial fans, probably a medial portion of the alluvial fan, not right on the basin margin. Uh, sandstones, fine-grained sandstones, mudstones, for instance. Um, just photos of the ash unit reworked towards the top, but uh, Kit Mather, a woman from Whitehall, Kit and I were out one time uh, and thought we had located a skull. We just saw, actually it was the back of the skull, in the road cut on Anthony North. So we waited until Don brought his students out. He brings his high school students out every July. And so we waited for them, and they actually put a plaster cast on this and took it back to the web schools with them. And one of their prep people prepped it up. And yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great skull. And so it's unlike the other fragmental material that we've been pulling out, horse teeth, reptile, scales, etc. So this is Paratomarctus from that site. And then this is just what's in the Museum of the Rockies collection. Some students did a student project for a Sud Strat class last year and put these together. And you can see there's a lot of material, but overall fairly fragmental, except of course for the dog skull. Um, and it looks like relative, you know, ages, we think it's Barstovian, so that would be about 16 to 14 million years in age for that collection. So we'll see what that tough unit comes in at. That should be interesting. Other things that I find interesting in the Anthony area, there are root structures, so you know there was some uh, basically dormancy to the sedimentation in that area. And these are kind of neat. These are actually earthworm burrows. When the worms become 
dormant. They make these, they're called estivation chambers, and it turns out these are really rare. There's only one other reported uh, location for these earthworm burrows. So those are kind of fun to look at. Uh, the pipestone. Okay, Pipestone, as you saw on the map, is sitting over there, south side of the interstate. If you drive the interstate and you're about to go up home stake, those white areas to the south, right against the Bathlet, that's the Pipestone main locality. That is world renowned to vertebrate paleontologists. Um, Earl Douglas, who was an amazing guy, and I'll talk about him in a few minutes started to collect there in 1899. And I, yeah, as you can see, this came out of his journal. Alan Tabram and a number of volunteers from the Carnegie have been trying to transcribe Douglas's journals. And they've made a really good effort at it. But Pipestone is just prolific for fossils. And it has been since Earl Douglas started in 1899. Uh, and as I said before, Don Lofgren now owns that. Alan talked him into buying it, so it wouldn't be all developed. And just a look at uh, the tuff that we collected from there. You can see, here's the base of the section. Here's the tuff, this resistant ridge. Here's a little closer shot of that. And then here's the actual tuff that we hacked away at. And it's near the base of the section, which is good. And actually, it's only about 30 feet below the main fossil bearing zone. So I think that's as good as we're going to get. No, that's fine. I just remembered mine right before I came in, so. OK, and like I said, like Anthony, Pipestone was really known for its fragmental material. But Don's students found these articulated. Here's a jaw with the teeth. It's Ishkairomis, a rodent, uh, kind of squirrel-like. You know, maybe they got up to about two feet in total length. Arboreal, like a squirrel, but nice articulated specimen. I mean, it's, yeah, that's pretty fantastic. And as we said here, as far as we know, articulated specimens are very rare there. So Don's students found that. That was pretty neat. And for me, I, because I'm more of a sedimentologist stratigrapher, I like the trace fossils. You can see these little cups here. They're just, you know, little burrows. And ah, there are several zones of pipestone. So, you know, it was dry and the depth that they burrowed, they weren't intersecting the water table, so things were really dried out. And best guess now, uh, Sheldon and Hammer did some work at Little Pipestone, you know, just about 10 miles to the south southeast of the main Pipestone locale. Probably made by arthropods, maybe cicadas is the best guess at this point. Okay, up to Canyon Ferry, and yeah, there's a couple of really neat locales here. One is White Earth, and the other we just call the insect beds. Whoops. OK, um, this is a track site, probably a heron-type bird. Uh, and actually, the tracks were made into volcanic ash. So we did sample that volcanic ash where there weren't tracks. Here you see the cast. So it's this track that has later been infilled by sediment from above. And um, yeah, well, we'll see what happens. Dale, Hoff <laughs> Dale, Dale Hoffman, Dale Hansen from the museum has been working this site as well as the insect beds. It's probably a uh, land mammal age, what we call a <coughs> Rickerium, but about 25 million years in age. And he has mammal fossils that <laughs> someone brought him into the museum one day. We don't know exactly where they came from. All she told Jack is somewhere along the beach on that side. And he tried to relocate them, anything coming out of ah, the cliffs. But all we can find are the tracks, which are kind of neat. But, but we'll see on that. The other site that's not too far, it's just north of the White Earth Campground, 
is what's called the inset beds. And Dave Wade, one of the students you saw on the slide from Sage Creek, went out with us a couple months ago. And Dave retrieved uh, probably a beetle-like insect. Uh, MSU and the museum did work here uh, back in the early 2000s and amassed quite a few specimens of insects. They have a paper on that, I think 2002. But their age date for the site came from this ash flow tuff. Uh, and they came up with an age date based on zircon, which is about 32 million years in age. And it turns out there's some question about using zircon versus another mineral called sanidine, because zircon probably is more the magma chamber cooling age, where sanidine is a mineral that was formed at the eruption time. And so we actually sample it. You can kind of see it down here. Here's the uh, big Pulaski that I used to sample it. Um, we sampled it. Lots of really nice coarse sanidine in there. And that's also at the New Mexico Geochron Lab. We just want to see if that's really true, if there is a difference. Uh, unfortunately, this is about 180 meters below the insect beds, if you really stack up the section. And there's no faulting in between. But uh, right now, that's the best we can do. OK, in the Madison Bluffs. Uh, as I said before, the Madison Bluffs, right now, it really revolves around work Earl Douglas did in 1894 to 1896. This is his schoolhouse that's still there. So he came out. He was not a geologist, not a vertebrate paleontologist. but. What do you find? What are you going to do when you're not teaching? And the Madison Bluffs are right there. So he explored the Madison Bluffs. He actually ended up selling a lot of petrified wood to the first uh, Ward scientific person, Mr. Ward himself. Uh, but he amassed just an amazing collection of fossil vertebrates. And he used that collection for a master's thesis at U of M in Missoula, and it was the first master's that was given out. And in fact, um, Earl Douglas, because he amassed this great collection, that's what sparked Carnegie to send out an expedition in 1902. And I mean, Earl Douglas, people usually know him for Dinosaur National Monument because he did find the original stuff there. But he really got Montana tertiary work going. I mean, he got around. He got to Pipestone. It was here. He got up to Canyon Ferry, Sage Creek, the Blacktail. Yeah, I, I find it quite remarkable, actually. He did a lot. And as I said before, Alan Tabrum and other volunteers at the Carnegie are transcribing Earl Douglas's journals. I mean, he was a prolific writer. And as you can see, here's just a, an excerpt from his journal showing where he actually collected some of the fossils. And ha, I have a hard time. I mean, I can't really transcribe that very well. But uh, Alan and his uh, volunteers have done most of the journals. They were archived in Salt Lake City. So Alan got permission to take a look at those. And here's, this is what he called, what Douglas called Brown Butte. And so here's a photo that I took of it, looking for those same zones. His petrified wood horizon that he used to sell to Ward Scientific. And actually, most of his fossils are from up in this zone. And Alan Tabram dug around in the Carnegie Museum holdings just to find some of the original fossils that Douglas came up with. And this is significant. It's a horse jaw. And when Earl Douglas found that, he had been thinking the Madison Bluffs are Cretaceous in age. But as soon as he found this, yeah, he understood, no, that's not right. It's younger than that. You would not find a horse jaw like this in the Cretaceous. So I thought that was a landmark piece. And again, you can see, here's his drawing of the horse jaw, and here's the excerpt from the journal. 
Uh, and here's another, this is a camel jaw that Douglas found. So a lot of those original finds are in the Carnegie Museum, which is really fun to go back and take a look at. We just don't know exactly or didn't know exactly where they came from. And hence, that was a problem for age constraints. But now I think we have a pretty good idea. And yeah, this is my thing about uh, calcic paleosol stacks. You can see a backpack down here for scale. So here's a calcic paleosol. Here's another one. And here's another one up here. This whitish stuff in between is deposition. So again, the idea of stable soil formation, you know, tens to 100,000 years taken to build up that amount of calcium carbonate soil just for scale. Uh, let's see, here's a trenching tool. That's St. Pulaski, basically. But here's a tuft down here that we did sample, again, uh, to try and get a better sample for an age date. But just to illustrate rootlets in the calcic paleosols, you can see uh, a central opening, you know, typically when these structures form, you have the original root and calcium carbonate builds up around it and eventually the root, the organic material just goes away. So you're left with a central cavity and that's a good indication for a root structure rather than a burrow. Uh, here's the top and here's Don Lofgren sampling it. Uh, yeah, from here down to here and you know, you can see there are probably multiple uh, depositional events. So we were trying to sample right at the base. So we'll see what happens. Um, okay, and the other project that I'll talk just briefly about, because we're only starting it, I don't know really what we'll find here, but this is in the Gravelly Range and it's in the Black Butte Lion Mountain area, if you're familiar with the Gravelly Range. Here's the snow crust, uh, greenhorns. Here's the ruby up here. So Dylan and this over here. Um, great access and interesting tertiary geology because it's elevated. And there's been a question uh, among geologists who work with tertiary deposits. Are these elevated deposits actually deposited at that elevation? Or are we looking at an original plane like a smooth surface that has been faulted and one side's gone up relative to the other side and therefore now they're isolated. Um, so I guess we shall see what we think about that. Um, this is Lion Mountain and we have two primary focuses for this project, Don Lofgren and probably Dale Hansen a bit will do the vertebrate paleontology. And age-wise, you know, we're looking, I don't know, 30, 32 million years in age, 31 million years in age. But for Lion Mountain, for this whole tertiary section, the vertebrates that have come out of it so far have come out of these cliffs up here. Uh, Malcolm McKenna, a vertebrate paleontologist, uh, he's passed now, but he was associated with the American Museum of Natural History. In the mid-90s, he and an MSU grad student collected from this area. In fact, when we were up there last summer, just off to this side in the bushes, we found their aluminum ladder that they used uh, to scale these cliffs. I'm not going to do that. I don't know if John, or if Don's going to do that. But yeah, apparently that's where the vertebrates came out of. Um, but there are some that they recovered that are now in the Harvard Natural History Museum as well as the American Museum. And Don's already visited both of those places to amass that data. So that will be his part of the project. Um, and Crystal Nielsen, who is an MSU Earth Science student, and myself will look at the geology of the tertiary deposits, you know, try and integrate that into what Don's finding. Um, I'm not sure exactly what Crystal will do. She got a scholarship to do a senior project there. So I'm kind of letting it up to her to decide what it is she's really interested in. But 
yeah, there's some really neat aspects. I mean, there are gravels up there that people have called all sorts of ages. I went up there late last summer. I don't really know. They didn't look old to me, but who knows? So we have a lot of work to do up there, and that will be a really fun project. OK, just in summary, uh, again, going back to the Madison Bluffs, these are some of the Sudstrat students that I had last year working on their project there. Um, yeah, there's a lot to do in the tertiary. I mean, you know, work's been going on since the Hayden survey came through here. But really, there is a lot of stuff to do. I mean, there are some good fossil databases set up. Uh, volcanic age dates, eh, not so good. And then, you know, we don't know, in some cases, how zircons match up with sanadines. So I think that will be, at least for me and my group, a real focus. But boy, there's just a lot to do. And eh, I think it's really fun. I mean, there's paleo, there's sedimentology, all sorts of good things. So anyways, I'll just end it there. and. If anyone has questions, I'm open to those. So, but I have to tell you that, you know, we just made a quick hike out there and I looked at it and thought, you know, there's no weathering lines. These look really clean and I don't see immediate stratigraphic relationships. So, I don't know, because when you drive around, um, let's say you're going back down into the upper, upper Ruby, so you come around uh, Teepee Basin, Teepee Mountain, there are conglomerates there, but those do look much older. And so far, they've been correlated with the Black Butte <coughs> gravels. So I don't know. I mean, I think it's recycling and you know, where do you stop with the beaver head? You know, in, in uh, just an explanation of the beaver head unit is late Cretaceous, kind of uh, in the Dillon Dell Lima over to maybe the Gravelies, uh, over into the Madison. Uh, and there are different lithologies for the cobbles, limestone, but these quartz sites, they are so resistant to erosion, it looks to me like they've been recycled again and again throughout the Cenozoic. So anywhere from Lake Cretaceous to the present time. And many mappings, when someone has seen these conglomerates, they just say Cretaceous. Um, so I would beg to differ on several locations where I've mapped, and they range from Quaternary to Cretaceous. But yeah, I don't know in the gravelways. Uh, I guess we'll try and figure that one out. It'll be fun to look at that stuff. So, do you have age constraints on what's below it? So, and your fossils below have come in at, are they shed room? Right. Because they would represent different 
Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah, extremely different climatic conditions. Yeah. Yeah. I'll have to look at that. That's interesting. Anybody else? Well, and I should say that uh, I talked to a couple of people that have collected some tertiary fossils. Um, you know, Dale Hansen at the Museum of the Rockies and Don Lofgren, who will be up here this summer, if you want to know what they are, those would be the people to ask. And I can always put you in touch with them. So if anybody would like to do that, yeah, I'd be glad to be the liaison for that. They're the vertebrate people. And they really would be glad to see other things. So. Yeah, let me know. Yeah, they were. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't know if this is too far afield for you to study, but have you done any work for anybody around frying pan basin here, Dylan? No, I think Katie has. I've, I've driven through there, but no uh, detailed work. I found fossilized wood there. I don't know what else might be found. Well, yeah, it, I mean, fossilized wood, if that's there, then that same fossilization process should be good for bones. Yeah. Uh, Katie, have you ever run across? No, I, I was looking at a little bit of the ash bodies there. And, and the really good exposures, I think, are on the east side of the frying pan. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Thank you.